So Bill Ackman <laughs> is a little bit of a household name. Maybe he's not a household name, but uh, if you're interested in finance or anything like that, it's a name that comes up. Um, you've heard of him before? I've heard of him before. Perfect. And some of you listening on the podcast may have also heard of him. So basically, um, I wasn't going to do uh, a segment on Bill Ackman and I wasn't going to do a segment on his um, hedge fund. But what I wanted to do a segment on is a SPAC that he is um, bringing to the market. And I realized that I need to kind of go back to the start to explain uh, why the SPAC's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So we're going to go from the top. So, Bill Ackman. Um, so uh, let's go from the top. So uh, so basically, uh, he's, he actually studied a Bachelor of Arts. We love a good founder story. Here we go. Going back to the uni <laughs> days. <laughs> he studied a Bachelor of Arts yeah. um, majoring in um, social studies yeah. at Harvard College. Um, which is a little bit random. Harvard is one of the good ones, though. It is, but I've bachelor, heard of that one bachelor of Arts? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so random. Anyway. Um, but So then he went on uh, a few years later to then uh, do his MBA at um, Harvard Business. Okay, yeah. So that's cool. Made up for it there, I suppose. Um, and so in regards to his uh, personal life... He I just want to say one thing really quick. Okay. Um, there's a book called Everything They Teach You at Harvard. Yeah. And there's a book called Everything They Don't Teach You in Harvard. And if you read both of those books, you will have the sum of all human knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, you know. True. Anyway, sorry for uh, <laughs> ruining your segment. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, okay, so... Um, it was relevant. He was married um, to a lady named Karen uh, Herskovich. Okay. Um, and they had three kids. And that was in 1994. And then at 2016, which is kind of recently, like five years ago, yep. um, they got divorced. Okay. And this is where the first little interesting fact comes out. All right. Uh, two, uh, two years later, he then became engaged to a lady named Neri Oxman. Now, other than her having an interesting name, there's nothing particularly interesting about that fact, other than she previously dated Brad Pitt. Ah. And some, source, some sources will even say that their relationship started whilst she was dating Brad wow. Pitt. Wow. Controversy. Yes. Controversy. <laughs> I think you mean. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I meant controversy. <laughs> How controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then uh, a year later they got married and they had another kid. So um, simple math would tell me he has four kids. Okay. Um, and so... What does advanced math tell you? <laughs> Sorry. <I'm> <laughs> derailing it. It's very important. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad I had their sunnies on. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, okay. So, um, so then, uh, okay. So his career and um, the hedge fund that he runs are virtually one and the same. So I thought, I'll just talk about his career now because um, it basically starts with um, one additional element and then it's all basically the hedge fund. So uh, he starts his career in 1992, uh, which is the year that he graduates his MBA. And he, him and a fellow Harvard graduate um, start a, um, a small fund called Gotham Partners. It's huh. interesting because it's the same name as the first product you mentioned yes. from Palantir. Gotham. Not related at all. Okay, cool. Just a, another cool name. And so um, in 2002, or well, by 2002, which is 10 years later, they had, um, well, they had $500 uh, million uh, uh, worth of assets under management. This is in US dollars. Um, and so uh, in the same year... Um, is the first key um, moment in his career. Uh, there's a few key elements of his career that make him famous. Yeah. Uh, shorting certain things, uh, uh, coming in and kind of taking over companies. And I'll just mention a few of these. He has somewhat of a controversial way of or method of acting, I think. Yeah. Um, and so um, the first company that he had beef with <laughs> is this company called uh, Municipal Bond Insurance Association. Uh uh, he has a bit of a history of beef with um, different companies and shorting certain companies and coming in and taking over boards. And so there's a few highlight um, moments from his career. So some of them include uh, a company called uh, Mun Municipal Bond Insurance Association, MBIA. Um, and so right around the great housing crisis or whatever in <laughs> 2008 or whatever. Whatever that was, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he basically saw um, this company, which is a financial services company, and they were their AAA ratings. He was saying, "Well, these really are not AAA rating um, assets." And so he he was kind of he was going to the authorities and saying, "Like this isn't um, this really shouldn't be allowed. Like there's a problem here. There's a problem here." No one was listening to him. He was going directly to the company. 
And so his solution was he ended up just shorting um, that stock, he, like basically bet against the stock, uh, right at the, ha- the height of the crisis. So he bet against municipal, correct? Whatever, correct? Because yep. he's saying the way they're operating, like it's not sustainable. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so, uh, as expect or as he expected, they f- completely crashed that stock. Do you want to do a, a quick explanation on what shorting is? Uh, I don't know. What is it? Oh well, all right. So shorting is you sell borrowed stock. Yeah. Uh, when at the start date. Okay. And then you buy it back at a later date. Yeah. For hopefully a lower price. Yeah. And then you return and then the you stock return it to, the to who you um, borrowed it from. Okay. So. Gotcha. You sell it first uh-huh. at high price because uh-huh. you think that it's going to go down in value. Um. So well, you borrow it. Yeah. And you sell it. Um. And then you wait for a later date. Yep. You buy it back. Yep. Then you return the stock yep. and you make a spread. Okay. And you're relying on it going down. I yes. guess that totally yep. makes sense. Um, and so he made like significant profit. And then that's where this, there's this book called um, Confidence Game, which was published in 2010, um, which is all about that um, situation. It's a full book on it, um, which is kind of cool. I, I haven't read it or anything. I'm not sure if it's good. Um, so then in 2005, uh, Wendy's, the, um, I don't know, like... Uh, food company. Yeah, I don't know what they do. I don't know what they hot do. Dogs. Is it hot dogs that kind of thing? I hot feel dogs, like it's maybe hot dogs burgers and, and stuff. ice creams or something. Ice creams. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. Hot uh, dogs. Maybe ice I'm creams. wrong. Um, so, um, so he goes in. Uh, Persian Capital um, goes in and buys significant share in. And sh- Persian Capital is the name of his. Sorry. Yeah. Fund. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yes, that's right. Um, so they go in and they buy significant share in Wendy's International, which is the company, um, and uh, basically. Um, Wendy's International also owns another company called Tim Hortons. Okay. Have you ever heard of Tim Hortons? Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure what they do. So Tim Hortons, um, uh, I think mainly um, Canadian um, franchise, and they basically are like coffee and donuts. Yeah, okay. Classic, like American sort of stuff. <laughs> um, Classic Americans. In Canada. And, um, and so uh, his shtick was like, well, we need to sell this off. Um, I don't know the reasoning behind it, but... And so... He basically um, pressured the board, pressured the board, and um, they spun off the, the, the full chain of Tim Hortons um, in an IPO in uh, 2006, which is just a year later after he bought into Wendy's. Um, and they raised $670 million um, from that sale. Um, and then B- Bill Ackman or uh, Persian Capital um, sold their shares for a big profit. And then the stock, Wendy's stock, um, like totally tanked. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. You um, got them good. <laughs> and so, yeah, a little bit of controversy around that one. So, yeah, obviously, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah he's, try- he's purposely trying to get rid of it. and Yes. Yeah. Not not really in good faith making an IPO. Yeah. It, yeah. Ca- it kind of looks like he comes in, s- like just sells an asset, makes a bunch of money, yeah. leaves, and then everyone's sort of left picking up the pieces going, hey, like now we've got something that is like worth less than it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so in 2007, about a year later, um, Target Corporation, um, you know, the big retail chain, um, they bought in 10% stake uh, in that company and with the intention of getting five board seats. And uh, it was apparently a big battle to try and get these seats. And he actually lost um, that battle and couldn't get uh, a seat on the board. And so um, like sold his stake in the company. Okay. And so I thought that's interesting. That's an example of him failing. Um, so then in 2009, so two years later, uh, his next venture was a company called General Growth Properties Incorporated. And so they were at the time one of the largest um, shopping center um, operators and owners uh, in the US. Yeah. And uh, through a bunch of bad debt situations and stuff like that, um, they basically were right um, on bankruptcy. And so um, Persian Capital swooped in uh, with a $60 million investment with a few other firms um, and um, saved uh, general growth properties from bankruptcy. And um, and that's apparently one of his best investments. It was a 26X um, investment, his net return, uh, when they sold, uh, I think it was five years later, was uh, one point six billion dollars from a cool. sixty million dollar investment. So that's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's what private good. equity is there for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, in twenty eleven, a company called Borders Group. Do you remember Borders yeah, Group? Yeah, Borders, the bookseller. Yeah, yeah. Books. yeah. Um, so they bought a thirty eight over a couple of years. Um, they bought a thirty eight percent stake in Borders. Yeah. And um, 
and Borders actually ended up going bankrupt. They lost three hundred million dollars. Yeah, that. yeah. Um, so definitely not around anymore. No, haven't seen them for a while. But I do remember him as a kid. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hasn't been that long. So then in uh, twenty eleven, uh, again, Persian Capital purchased a fifteen percent stake in a company called Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, oh, yeah. CP for short. So there's a bunch of changes in the management structure, and so he uh, they removed the CEO put in a whole bunch of different, uh, they changed the board um, and stuff like that. Mainly just managerial changes, not necessarily business um, things, products or anything like that. Um, and the share price um, rose from over five years again, from 2011 to 2016, from $49 to $220. And so they sold their 7% stake, which is about half of their original investment, um, for $1.45 billion. Again, uh, a pretty decent profit. Yeah, cool. Um, two more. Um, in 2012, so they were able. Hang on, go back to that one. They yes. were able to. They only had a seven percent stake, but they, they were had a able 15% to. Fifteen percent stake. Oh, they had a fifteen percent stake. Yeah. But they were able to. So. Yes, fifteen percent stake. Are you going to say that uh, he was? How were they able to change all the management with a fifteen percent? That's right. I, I think in this particular situation, he's not necessarily credited for making the changes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think he just he just happened to also. He be was there. a part of yeah the uh, the whole and situation. Everyone has an influence in, on the right. board. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, why, why it might not have actually been official. He he may have had some influence. Yeah. Um, in twenty twelve, a company called um Herbal Life, which it still exists today. Yes. Um, and the CEO and founder is is a guy named Mark Hughes. Um, uh, is it is it this company? I think it's this company. Um, and so basically, Bill argued that it had zero, essentially zero value because it was just a pyramid scheme. Yeah. Um, and so he again entered in a $1 billion short against this company, which is huge. Yes. Um, and yeah. then he's even cited on TV in like a live argument with this guy named Bill, um, Icahn. Carl? Who, what did I say? What? You said Bill. Oh, sorry. Maybe. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is How'd what you I know was, that? This is what I was thinking of before. <laughs> oh, wait. It was actually, I knew the name and oh, I saw the name here. Oh, oh, okay. And I was like, ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Bill Icahn. Um, so he, he's... Oh, did I say Bill again? <laughs> 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 Sorry, Carl, Carl Icahn. Um, th- there's like a there's like a TV interview, and they're like on a, some live um, TV show, and they're having this big argument. Yeah. About so the there's reasons. multiple there's multiple CNBC right. um, clips of them arguing as well. It's right. heaps funny. Okay. I've watched yeah, I've watched a few of them. Perfect. So you can get on there. And, and now have a they look. refuse to go on together. Oh. So now they're on separate there you um, go. segments as well. That's funny. Um, and so, again, in this particular situation, um, um, HLF or Herbalife plunged 60%, yeah. but not before almost completely rebounding. And in 2018, built, uh, exited his short position with yep. really not much of a profit to, to walk away from. Um, then, apparently, there's a Netflix documentary about this whole situation <laughs> called Betting on Zero. Have you heard of it? Uh, I haven't heard of it, no. No, neither. I haven't heard of it either. Um, and apparently has a 7.2 rating on IMB, IMDB. Well, that's a good rating. Is it? Yeah, 7.2. Yeah, it's all right. 9.2 is the highest rating on IMDB. Really? The Godfather. Okay. True. So 7.2 is only two off that. Yes, that's right. Um, and so the last company in 2016 um, was a company called Valiant Pharmaceuticals, which still exists again, although under a name change to Bosch Health. Bosch Health, okay. Yep. Um, and it's it was a Canadian, or it is a Canadian uh, pharma company. I don't know what drugs they they manufactured or whatever. But um, the, uh, um, basically, uh, the uh, there was a bunch of SEC investigation into the company, into the way they were operating and yep. stuff like that. And so the stock price just took a massive plummet because of that. Um, kind of like what we were talking before. In Sort of any investigation is going to lead to that. Yeah. It's just uncertainty. Um, and so then in 2016, um, I think, I assume Bill saw like a ripe opportunity here. Um, and so um, they they um, took a um, uh, like a stake in the company. Um, but unfortunately, it really didn't recover. And so they took a really big loss um, at the end of 2016, almost $3 billion okay, um, cool. loss, which was um, seems pretty substantial. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the net effect of all of that is, but uh, there's certainly been, I was looking at his results, like of his hedge fund over the last few years. Yeah. It seems to like the, 
is it early on he gets years where he's up 40% and he's yeah. up stuff like that yeah and then if, like 2016 I think it was he was like down 16% and then the year after that he's like up 4% yeah yeah Um, and so it's interesting to see what his most recent um, performance has been like it doesn't look super impressive yeah but you know it is what it is so it's Pershing Square did you say it's a hedge fund or did you say it's a yeah, investment? No, it's a, it's a there's so there's two. Uh, let, let me come to that in just a second. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, I'll explain. That there's, yeah, there's two organisations. Um, so just a little bit more interesting stuff about Bill, and then I'll go into the um the hedge fund itself. All right. So a little bit of interesting stuff um to mix it up here. So um he owns a Gulfstream, yeah, jet, which is kind of cool. Um, he funded and endorsed uh Michael Bloomberg's 2020 presidential nomination. Oh. Um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. His net worth is... I would have assumed that was all um, Mr. Bloomberg himself. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, he probably didn't 100% fund it, but he contributed. Yeah, yeah true, right. yeah. Um, uh, His net worth is estimated to be over a billion dollars, Yeah, uh, which is awesome. Um, And there's... Okay, this is a really interesting thing. So that he did this charity lunch um, uh, in 2019. And so it was in partnership with this organization called the David Lynch Foundation. Sorry, and it's for um, it's basically to uh, this foundation is to support those who have had PTSD, of some, you know, f- from some situation, okay, um, and so um, this gu- the guy who won it is a guy named Andrew Wilkinson, who you may or may not have ever heard of. Do you, uh, you ever? I don't know. Okay, but perfect. He's um, and so friend. so he won this uh, charity lunch, which is basically you can have a one to two hour lunch with Bill, <laughs> yeah. um, and Bill will pay for the lunch. And uh, it was a bidding auction to w- to win that. Yeah, this guy named Andrew Wilkinson, Wilkinson who's a young Canadian, uh, I think he was uh, in his early thirties or maybe even late twenties. Um, he won it uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and his his bid was fifty seven thousand dollars US dollars. And he's the founder of a holding company called Tiny. And uh, during the lunch, it actually uh, subsequent events led to um, Bill investing in one of his um, companies, one, one of Andrew Wilkinson's companies called WeCommerce, which is basically a bunch of Shopify plugins and stuff like yeah. that, like a bunch of them. And they IPO'd that business, WeCommerce, on the Canadian exchange for $45 million. I think I've heard of this guy before. Yeah, You have? I, yeah. Because he's been on My First Million. Yeah. And so he's friends with um, one of the guys on a podcast that we listen to called My First Million. Yeah. And he has, um, I think, a really awesome outlook on investing and stuff like that. He's all about, you know, m- meeting new people and, and trying to help people and, and find uh, situations that are going to be profitable, but not just for him, but for everybody and stuff like that. So, yeah, really cool dude. Um, and so, cool that he got a bit of a jump start with this um, little investment. Uh, okay, a few other little interesting quick facts. Um, he doesn't eat dairy. He doesn't drink coffee. He joined Twitter in 2017. Like yes, it's true. <laughs> he, he he joined Twitter in 2017, which is remarked to be relatively late um, to get onto that bandwagon. Hey, you were pretty late to Twitter as well. It's true. Um, Confirmation bias right here. <laughs> <laughs> I am the best. <laughs> um, and um, just for reference, his fund Persian Capital is not in. It's not even in the top t- ten hedge funds in the world. I do have a quick list here. BlackRock is the um, top fund with $100 billion in um, assets. Is BlackRock Rock a hedge fund, though? Yeah. According. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I see what you're saying. So uh, BlackRock have, it's called uh, BlackRock Financial, blah, 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 blah. And then within that um, conglomerate, they have um, an internal hedge fund, okay. which is called BlackRock Advisory. Okay. Um. And uh, like Bridgewater Associates with Ray Dalio is kind yeah. of famous, yeah. 150 billion. Yeah. Um, and Citadel um, is kind of famous recently with the whole for the GameStop um, thing. GameStop thing, and yeah. that's uh, 30 billion. Um, and so okay, so Persian Square Holdings is the holding company that has all of the assets um, uh, that they own, uh, and which includes this spec that I'm about to mention. Yeah. And then Persian Square Capital Management um, is the um, financial advisory company um, that um, advises on all of the sponsorships that they do for the SPACs that they have in place at the moment and blah, 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 other stuff. Um, so um, the hedge fund has uh, over $12 billion in assets, which I guess it's kind of like around half of Citadel 
um, which is the 10th largest um, in the world. So it's not huge, but I guess 12 million, it's 12 billion still a lot. Um, their portfolio looked like companies in 2020, such as, what do you, oh, yeah, I see, little R8 going past. Pretty cool. Uh, very cool. Uh, companies such as, it seems kind of value kind of stocks. It's like yeah. Lowe's, which is like Bunnings, but in America. Uh, Howard Hughes Corporation, uh, which I think is just, uh, uh, actually, that's a good question. I need to look into that. It's a really big conglomerate. Okay. Um, there's a guy named Howard Hughes, which looks like a really cool dude. Um, it's an old, really old company. Um, Hilton Worldwide, obviously um, hotel chain. Uh, Restaurant Brands International, um, which is Burger King, Tim Hortons, Popeyes, um, Chipotle, um, uh, Starbucks, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, um, which they don't own anymore, but they did. Um, and the SPAC that I'd like to mention, which is called Pershing Square Tontine or Tontine Holdings <laughs> yep. Incorporated. Yeah. Um, so um, Pershing Square um, Tontine Holdings uh, came to my attention mainly because of the company that they um, had targeted for their acquisition, um, which was a company called uh, Universal Music Group. Um, which is obviously pretty famous. Like most people have heard of Universal Music before, right? Yeah. Um, and um, Universal Music is owned by a company. Uh, it's like 52% currently owned by a company. Uh, where did I write that down here? Ah, Vivendi. So it's a company called Vivendi that Vivendi. owns uh, like 51, 52%. Um, currently of uh, Universal Music Group or okay. UMG. And so the agreement was to buy 10% um, of Universal, Universal Music Group from this company called Vivendi. Okay, cool. So, um, to, um, Tontine, I wasn't sure what that meant. I, I thought it was like a term that he just sort of come up with, but I realized that it's got some sort of inherent meaning. Um, and so back in the 1700s and the 1800s, apparently... Um, it was basically when they would get a whole bunch of individuals to pull their money together uh, into some form of fund or whatever. Or in this situation, it was for um, to build. Uh, I saw some examples of building um, property and stuff like that. Um, and there's incentives. Basically, there's ins there's some sort of incentive in place for long term investment. Um, and so in this situation, back in the 1700s, 1800s, the incentive was that as people died. Um, their dividends that should have been paid to them are now redistributed towards those who are still um, surviving members. Right, okay. And so as you get older and older and older and people die, uh, you get more and more and more dividends until you're literally the last person receiving the full dividend. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then um, at which point when you die, apparently the government steps in um, and I don't know. Uh, there's some sort of legal process that okay. ends it. So it's apparently it's a term that was used mainly in the 1700s, 1800s, and then it kind of went out of circulation in the 1900s. And so um, he's incorporated this term into his SPAC, and I'll yep. try and explain um, how he's um, put that incentive for the long-term investment in a second. So it was incorporated in 2020, which is about a year ago, yep. um, and their office is based is in New Jersey. Um, and so Persian Square Capital Management is the sponsor advisor. Um, so they um, are the ones that are kind of like getting everybody together. They're getting um, all of the sponsors together, the yeah. private companies or hedge funds or whatever who are going to um, buy into this um, SPAC deal yeah. privately. Um, and then Pershing Square Holdings, their holdings company, is one of those sponsors right. um, that has contributed money towards the deal. Um, and obviously this is all led by Bill. Um, and so, um, there's 5 billion in, um, committed capital from these private companies or private, um, organizations, um, for this particular deal. Um, and their target was a, was a company that's valued at $10 billion or greater. Obviously, um, Universal Music, they're only acquiring 10% of it, but it was yeah. the value of the actual company that they're, um, that's related to. Right. Okay. So it's not the company. It's not the value of the stake in the company. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I guess it's just more inferring the size of the company that they want to um, acquire a percentage of. Yeah. Okay. So the target requirements, <laughs> the target requirements. <laughs> two and a half hour episode. <laughs> We've both got another segment. <laughs> <laughs> the target requirements for the um, business that they were going to acquire. So $10 million. $10 billion, billion size yeah. or greater. 
Um, and the target requirements were simple and predictable um, free cash flows, large barriers of entry, high returns on capital, limited exposure to risk, strong balance sheet, and excellent management. I feel like they're all just like things that you'd obviously want in every company. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, nothing, nothing particularly outstanding there Correct. that I can see. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for a long, oh, for for the last, I don't know, couple of months, it it was it's been announced that their acquisition target was Universal Music Group. Um, I explained that Vivendi owned and, and shareholders owned um, more than 50% and they were going to purchase 10% from them. Um, another company called Tencent Music Entertainment, which Tencent. I assume... Yeah. Um, Do you know what Tencent is? I know what Tencent is, so I assume yeah. this is an offshoot of the main company. Yeah. Um, they own 20% of it um, and a couple of other companies make up the difference. Um, so when this IPO'd um, uh, back in 2020, the IPO price was $20. Um, and it's broken down into three elements. So for $20, um, this is the three elements that you get. This is the tontine concept coming into play here. The tontine. So obviously you get um, UMG shares or Universal Music shares. Yes, yeah. Um, and of your $20, you get, um, uh, of your $20, they negotiated an enterprise um, price of $14.50 per share. So for your $20, you're going to get one share, which is worth $14.50. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, just recently, uh, Goldman Sachs um, valued um, Universal Music at $18.13. All right. So you can see there already you, you're arbitraging a profit of 25% because you're getting um, uh, one share for $14.50. Yeah. But the current market valuation is eighteen thirteen. So Should we just quickly go over what uh, arbitrage is? Oh, yes. I mean, that's the first time we've talked about arbitrage. True. Okay. So arbitrage is basically when you buy something or, yeah, if you buy an asset or something in one market and basically without risk can then go and resell at a higher price. I guess maybe classically it might be buying something in one country and selling it in another country's market. You can't do that so much nowadays with technology. Yeah. Um, but people are always looking for... People and companies are always looking for arbitrage opportunities because the, the key is that there there's no risk involved. You yeah. can see an opportunity to buy and sell um, and make a profit. Yeah, yeah. So like a really good yeah. So like a really good example that some people used to do that yep. used to be a genuine arbitrage opportunity. Yep. Used to be Harley Davidsons. Oh. Um, because you could buy them in the U.S. for ten thousand USD yep. or something. <laughs> um, and it was at the time where it was like dollar for dollar, yep. you know, so ten, basically 10,000 AUD. Yep. You could import it for $5,000 yeah. uh, and then you could sell it for $30,000. Okay, gotcha. So like the whole the yep. whole purpose there was they made a huge spread yes. and that was their arbitrage spread. So yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. Um, okay, so uh, you get um, one, so let's say you just buy one share at IPO for $20. You get um, one share of um, Universal Music Group um, for, the, for the value of $14.50. And then um, you get five dollars fifty. Your your remaining of the twenty dollars um, continues on ownership in this company that they're terming Remain Co., which is basically the second um, deal that will make up the completion of this back. I've never heard of this before, and th this so is it's a two part. It's like it's a two a part split. It's a two part okay. um, SPAC. and so there's a first deal, second deal. The second deal has not been announced at all. Okay. And so, um, so five fifty or twenty eight percent of your original purchase price of the twenty twenty dollars, twenty eight percent of it goes towards the second um, acquisition target. And so, left um, over currently is two point nine billion dollars in cash for the second deal, um, which is one point five billion dollars in current um, PSTH, which is the name of the um, SPAC investors. Yeah. And Persian Square has the option to buy an additional $1.4 billion of that stock. Um, uh, not the obligation, just the option. Um, okay, so you get UMG share. You get uh, uh, $5.50 um, worth of value uh, in the second um, SPAC deal. And the third thing is you also get a warrant. Um, so uh, a warrant. Yeah, yeah, so he's also doing... Um, a, a third, or not a third spec. That first one is has one spec with two elements. He's doing a second spec, Bill Ackman, um, and this is um, sometime in the next five years. Um, you get a warrant that allows you the purchase um, of this new company, uh, this new spec, which is called Spark, um, and it's called Spark Holdings, 
and you get the uh, the opportunity, but again, not the obligation, to purchase um, one share uh, for twenty dollars per share. And uh, it can be exercised, which is, this is the key here, it can be exercised after the agreement's been announced for the acquisition target and after the stock price has reached over $24. Right. You get the opportunity to buy for $20. Okay, cool. Which again, it's an arbitrage of $4. Yeah. Um, And so with that particular SPAC, um, there is somewhere between 6 to $10 billion worth of capital um, on the table able to be used to acquire or merge um, with the target. Um, $5.6 billion is um, if all of the current shareholders exercise their warrant. Yeah. And Persian Capital has a minimum investment of $1 billion up to $5 billion. So you put that together, you get somewhere between uh, 6 and $10 billion towards this second SPAC. Yeah. And that has to be completed within five years. This is a very confusing deal. So like I've I know, never I I've know, never heard of I know. I can remember Chimath saying something specific about how you can never do more than one deal based off one spec. Right. So yes. this is like a direct contradiction to like so something that I've heard before. So it's wh- a very interesting When I was reading the uh uh might have been ten K or whatever it's called. It's a statement. So one of the SEC forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I was reading it, it was saying it said specifically that the second deal has to be within X amount of time because it's technically not a SPAC anymore. Yeah, okay. And so, as you're saying, there is some sort of I think he's trying to basically throw the loophole here. Yeah. Um, where he he can make a second acquisition, but it's not technically still a SPAC or something. Um, but I agree, it is really confusing. And if you yeah. go on and watch all of his interviews at the moment, this is the first thing they start talking about. They're like. Uh, I was watching an interview um, recently, and it. The, uh, let me finish this, and I'll. I'll yeah. tell, then tell me about the interview. <laughs> yes, um, and so, um, uh, so that second spec within the next five years, we'll find like the next company to invest in. And I mean, I watched like a couple of YouTube videos, and one or two people mentioned Stripe, which would be so cool. Stripe is very cool. Um, so, that's an interesting um, thing to consider. Um, so. Unfortunately, the SEC came out in the last week and said that the deal between UMG and um, and uh, the the SPAC didn't meet um, the um, sp- the the SPAC rules, <laughs> yeah. as you kind of just mentioned. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I, I, they didn't specify why or anything because it wasn't a public statement. It was just a private notification to um, the SPAC, and so the board decided to not continue with. Um, that particular deal with UMG and dropped the um, acquisition. Okay, all right. So it's basically so no, now... it's not going to be now, No, now it's, now it's a completely blank a blank check company. Yeah, yeah. Which is really interesting. So I... Okay, so then I watched an interview with Bill, uh, which was... Uh, this only really happened like two or three days ago. I watched an interview with him and he was saying a lot of what I mentioned and then he said that basically um, they're looking for a new um, combination target still. Yeah, okay. Um, and they have 18 months um, to, to find that uh, company and to make that um, merger happen. Right. Um, so it's an interesting company. As I know it's really confusing. There's a lot of elements to it, but um, it's really different and uh, I think it's uh, really interesting. Cool. And if it takes owning random companies to then get... Um, a cheap price on like Stripe because as soon as like, yeah. can you imagine if they announce that they're going to acquire Stripe? So Stripe is the payments. Um, oh, yeah. It's a, it's a plugin Sorry. that goes into websites yeah. and it's like a credit card. It takes your credit card info. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a really good interface that can go into like any website yeah. or, you know, like provides multiple payment methods for people yeah. and it's just like an easy yeah. easy to use and heaps of developers take it on use yeah. that with their websites it's the prime back end um, excuse me processing tool for Shopify stores which yeah. make up X percentage of stores on the in the internet which would be a lot and then I think from what I can tell um, most good user experiences is because you're using Stripe yeah yeah at the back end, I used one recently. I purchased like some cologne on like Chemist Warehouse, and I don't know what their back end was, but it was some cologne. Yeah, wow. It was just cheap. I just bought it. Um, <laughs> it was so clunky, and I was like, "Dang, this is what it used to be like." Yeah, it yeah. was. I do have to like go to this, this this weird thing comes up on the screen, which looks like it's from the nineties, and like it was just so ugly. And I was like, "Oh, true." Yeah, it yeah. had like Combank on it. I don't know. Um, yeah. Stripe, take that Combank. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
It's fine. Um, I'm not offended. <laughs> yeah, you don't like that. It's fine. Um, I, don't, I don't. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and so it's a cool company. Uh, Stripe uh, is cool because um, it lets it's you get really ready simple. for your dates. It's really simple. With Cologne. Um, and the code that they made is apparently genius. And it's like, what? It's like a few lines of code and you just put it in any website and it works yeah, yeah. apparently. I don't know. Yeah. Beyond our knowledge. Um, so it's a cool company. I own a little bit. Um, and it's cool. cool. So you got some. Yeah. You got some of the blank check. <laughs> oh, I should mention, I haven't talked about price much at all. Um, but because it's really... The, mention the price. No. Yes. So <laughs> it IPO'd at $20. Yeah. Current price is like $20.15 or something. Okay. But it got all the way up to $32. All right. So very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. A bull for Nathan. Yeah. Well, yeah. N- not as strong as yours. Not as strong as far mine. N- not as big a bull. Okay. Small bull. Small bull. Just, yeah, just, you know, small bull. Let's go, baby. 